folks are still hopping on. We're going to just wait another minute or so as people are finishing classes. We've got some folks gathering here at UHV main campus. Thank you to all of you joining us online and then Katie. We're going to get started in about just a minute or two. Thank you for coming. I don't even know where we started from. Is it letting you share your thing? If you want to share, I can let share. Hello, welcome. Hello. Went to the wrong place. Oh, come on in. Have a snack. Julie and Berto, we've got plenty of snacks. Thank you. Okay, so it's letting you share, Dr. Eugene. Mm -hmm. Excellent. This thing, let's see how does this work. The wireless mouse. Oh, maybe I should. Is it Sometimes the wireless one doesn't doesn't work. No, it's okay. <laughs> we have wired. Mm -hmm. All right. So, Dr. Eugene, it's letting you share. Looks like that's fine. And then we've got our online participants, and I'll monitor them in our chat, so we can see that. We'll just wait another minute or so for folks to come in. So everybody here on ground, let's just take a moment and online we'll do this too to kind of introduce ourselves. We've got a lot of different faces I haven't seen before. We've got new faces who are just joining us in teaching. So those of you online, hopefully you can see and hear us. And I wanted to start with a bit of an introduction. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Woodrow Wilson Wagner, and it's my privilege to serve as the director of strategic initiatives here at University of Houston, Victoria. And I also have the pleasure of teaching classes. So it's nice to be able to teach and do a, a lot of different projects for the university. I teach speech communication by the grace of Dr. Berg. And I also get to teach political science by the grace of Dr. Goodman. So it's always good to be able to still teach. So let's just, if you don't mind, introduce yourselves briefly and what you teach and what you're looking forward to learning today. Why did you come? You saw the invitation for me. You decided to come. Why, why did you come today? So let's just start by introducing the folks here and in person, and I'll ask you to speak up so our folks online can also hear. That's why I talk so loud. I want to make sure I'm speaking up. So let's start. Go ahead, ma'am. Well, good afternoon. My name is Roshonda Thomas. I'm here teaching uh, this, this semester with uh, healthcare strategy and management and planning. So I'm excited to learn more about the communication aspect, especially on the intercultural components. And so I'm here to learn all I can. Thank you. And then our featured presenter, many of you know Dr. Nicole Eugene, who's been here for a number of years, a very accomplished communication scholar and teacher. And this area of interest is something she's been writing about and thinking about and teaching for so many years. So we're so blessed to have you here today, Dr. Eugene. Thank you. Anything else you'd like to say in your intro? Yeah, just I'm happy to be here. Thank you for that introduction. Excellent. I'll do all your intros from now <laughs> And Dr. Andrew Berg, one of our chairs. Thank you, sir, for coming. Yeah, Andrew Berg, Professor of Communication. And I, this is year 18 or 19, I don't know wow. exactly how it is anymore, <laughs> but I'm here because I greatly respect Dr. Eugene and want to learn from her. She's a great colleague. It's great to work with her. So. Thank you, sir, for coming. Dr. Hernandez. I'm Humberto Hernandez, uh, Assistant Professor of Biology. Uh, I've been here for five years, and I'm always excited to hear about new ways or new things in pedagogy. Fantastic. Julie, Hi, thanks for coming. I'm Julie. I'm from International Programs. And actually, I came here because I'm, I've seen some of Dr. Eugene's uh, course material. And so I just really wanted to um, learn more. Excellent. Thank you for coming. Dr. White. <laughs> uh, Danny White. I am the uh, Interim Associate Provost of Curriculum of Student Success and a Biology Professor. And I come to these things because, especially when Nicole does them, I always learn something that I didn't know, but I always want to improve my teaching and improve anything that I can within the Success Center and share with my people. So I always enjoy these. 
Thank you, sir, for coming. I know you're very busy and we appreciate it. Great socks. Excellent. You can't see Dr. White's socks. They're fantastic. Look at that. There you go. Okay. Yes, ma'am. And I am Patricia Youngblood. I am a student and I also work at UHV. So uh, I received the invite and I uh, love Dr. Nicole. Yes, <laughs> I love a her work. Yes. <laughs> and so anytime I see anything of her, I try and come and and join in so and where do you work here at the university in finance oh excellent so we've got finance <laughs> student success international programs we have a variety of staff who are also joining us and i know we have several staff who are also online so those of you online if you don't mind just briefly introducing yourself what you teach or what you do here at uhv and why you've come today dr nadia penendring if you don't mind telling us who you are Hello, I uh, teach in English. I teach mostly freshman composition and some other upper division and grad classes. And I'm one. here to learn from Nicole. Yeah. I'm a part of the Nicole Eugene fan club. Oh, there we go. Turn us on. <laughs> Nadia? Nadia? Did you did you guys oh, not hear me? Hello, stop, do you stop. not hear me? Hello. Sorry about that, Nadia. Please, okay. please do it again. <laughs> can you hear me? I, we couldn't before, but now we can. <laughs> oh, great. Okay. Yeah, I teach rhetoric and composition, and I am part of the Nicole Eugene fan club. So I'm here <laughs> here uh, with the rest of you as part of that. Excellent. Thank you. Who else is joining us online? I see we've got, I think, Angela Hartman from Grant's office. Thank you, Angela, for joining us. Thank you, I'm happy to be here. Um, as you all know, sorry, um, faculty interests are my interests, you know, directing the Re Office of Research and Sponsor Program. And plus, um, I am a fan of Dr. Eugene's as well. And it seems like a very helpful presentation that I can use in day-to-day -day life. <laughs> Fantastic. We're so blessed to have Angela directing our grants office. I know a lot of faculty and staff have worked with her, and she's such a great partner in those efforts. Thank you, Angela. Miss Christy Holly is also with us. Thank you, Christy. You're welcome. Um, Christy Holly. I work in class. I'm the Canvas administrator. I've been here almost 26 years. And I decided to tune in because not all my faculty can all join into the actual presentation. So I thought if I could absorb some information that I can share with them, I thought it's a win-win. Christy, that is excellent. I love that attitude, right? She's always yeah. looking out for her faculty. That's so fantastic. Thank you. You're Dr. welcome. Hello. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry, I'm not camera ready. I didn't know our cameras were supposed to be on. It's OK. You don't have to um, turn it on. <laughs> it's what I, I made. So I just I'm a political science professor. I am also a fan of Dr. Eugene, <laughs> and I like to think that I'm pretty cognizant of different cultures. But of course, there's always room for improvement and to learn more and to see if I have any blind spots. So I am eager to learn. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Elo. And Dr. Jessica McHugh, one of our great colleagues. Okay, can we turn off that? Hey, it's Jess McHugh here. I teach in biology, and I got to hear some of Nicole's ideas on intercultural communication at the faculty development conference this summer, and I'm really uh, interested to hear more. And if you didn't hear about the faculty development conference that Dr. Jessica McHugh orchestrated and put together, this was one of the fantastic things I think we've ever done at UHV. And I hope we'll get the chance to do more of those because those people who went were very, very energized. I would encourage you to read the article in The Advocate, and I think we had a press release from UHV talking about that conference. But thank you, Dr. McHugh, not only for that work, but for all the work you do here at UHV. All right, Dr. Emmanuel Kwanzaa. Hello, sir. <laughs> Hi, yes, uh, this is uh, Dr. Kwanza. I teach uh, leadership and management from College of Business, and uh, I'm happy to be here. Excellent. Thank you, sir. And Carmen Rodriguez, one of our academic advisors. Fantastic. 
She's there. All right, good. Okay. And then Basante, thank you, Basante, for coming, one of our new communication instructors. And anybody else I missed or wanted to chime in? Masame. Masame, I'm sorry. Welcome, Masame. Thank you so much for coming. All right. Well, let's get to it. Dr. Nicole Eugene has prepared a fantastic presentation on intercultural communication and pedagogy. This is so relevant because this is something that our president and our provost and our academic leadership talk about a lot, which is meeting our students where they're at to get them to where we want them to be. How many times have we heard our president say that? One of the good ways to meet our students where they're at is to understand where they're coming from in terms of their cultural experiences. And Dr. Eugene has spent a lot of her professional life researching this, studying this, and then practicing this in the classroom. And I think we're all excited to hear some of her observations. Without further ado, Dr. Nicole Eugene, let's give her a big hand. All right. So um, in speaking about the great to have our faces down here. Um, I, but I, of course, I planned on like introducing myself and telling you a little bit about my background um, to, to get us started. So yeah, I came here at, in 2017. And one of the things that I was really looking forward to is teaching intercultural communication because I came from um, Ohio University where I had, um, there was the only one Mexican student that I met. And, and he, he was like the only Mexican student at at Ohio University. And um, so, so teaching intercultural communication in a really diverse context is really rewarding because uh, the students bring a lot to the class and are really excited and interested in, in the topic. And, um, and so I am, um, you know, wanted to be able to, to share some of this and, and bring this to the faculty so that as, a, as an institution we can like elevate our understanding of culture and you know be a little bit more confident in, in how we talk about things like identity and, and culture and it'll also improve how we how we serve our students and, and adapt our, our classes to our, our um, students so this um, is a bit of an overview that I, I came up with. I've changed since the summer, some of y'all. Um, I think I actually, I didn't show this when I was doing the summer version, but, but essentially, you know, we are at um, minority majority um, institution and in a state that's a minority majority book. Um, and this is really important for us to to be able to um, infuse this in our in our, our teaching so um, like me and a lot of our faculty you know, come from uh, across the world and across the US and uh, when they come to UHV we, we are invited to adapt our, our teaching to our, our students and we may not have a lot of guidance in, in doing that but we ultimately it is something that many of us do do figure out and um and i'm hoping that you'll be able to share some stories about how you've 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 done that and so what I we're hoping to do is is to, to elevate this this discourse and to continue this conversation because there are a lot of uh, different complexities and, and dynamics involved um, so, so this is just a, 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 like a to get the conversation started. But at at the end, I'll invite you to join me in learning more about inclusive teaching by by joining me as I as I um learn through a, a MOOC an online class that Cornell offers. Um, it actually, as I started it, you know, last month, it said like you know you should. Do this with other faculty and that um, so that you can talk about you know what what y'all are learning and and you're able to you know strengthen y'all's relationships and so that is something that i hope that you know 
people will join me in doing and continuing this conversation, but it's also something that will go beyond this semester and, and because there are different uh, courses out there and, um, and ideally, you know, we'll um, be able to, to do different things with this. But um, so, so also, ideally, we'd, um, as a solution, also include this, some of this in, in our new faculty orientation. Um, and I also have some of our demographic information by, separated by undergrad and grad and college, by the different colleges. And so I'm hoping to be able to share that with, with everybody so that we can be able to think about you know, our student bodies in terms of our college and be able to think about the, um, the demographics and how we, how we adapt to, to our students in, at that level. Um, and, and so as a result, of course, we're hoping to increase how faculty and students engage with each other and how, um, you know, we engage with our, our community. I, um, sorry, I just realized, like, I was, like, going to set a timer so I don't lose track of time, so I need to do that. All right. Um, so, of course, there's challenges. I'm not gonna, and so not everybody is going to um, have time for this and um, but but by, by joining you know you're able to, to talk about this with other people and keep the momentum going because I, ideally you know we'll we'll be able to have more faculty you know in, engage with these these topics and be able to increase our retention and, and just make UHB a place where our students really feel welcomed and um, understood. So um, so yeah, so let's um, go ahead and, and get started. So ultimately, the, the goal is um, is that you know we begin evaluating and improving our own intercultural competency and our pedagogy inside the classroom and outside the classroom. So um, to break this down, you know, this means increasing the cultural competency of faculty and also increasing how we adapt our classroom pedagogy to our student backgrounds. So um, this all started with, um, of course, in 2017, when I came here, I realized that I wasn't the only one who was coming from a R2 school that's not an R1, but most of us do come from these research-heavy institutions that, that um, if you're not in, in Texas, the demographics are, are going to be really different from, from UHV in, in either way, if it is a, still an R1 or two, there's still going to be significant differences in, the, in, um, in certain demographics. But, um, but for many faculty, there's a lack of familiarity with uh, first-gen and non-traditional students or um, Hispanic culture or um, other, other populations. So, um, so this is something that, that we, we were able to address by learning how to adapt our teaching and our syllabus policies that will um, you know take into consideration students student backgrounds so um so i come as somebody who is in a cultural teacher um and i'm also still a person who is interested in learning more about inclusive pedagogy because um because part of what we in, in, in teaching intercultural communication, we teach students that there's this, an, an aspect of it that is about being uncomfortable. It's about you know, coming up against things that you may not have realized and, and working on you know, being open and having the right attitude and the right skills to be able to adapt to the situations that you find yourself in. And, and so there's this, it's an ongoing process and it's important for us to, to keep, be able to talk about that and and um, you know be open about that because there's it's not about being right or being wrong um, here. Um, but but ultimately in the spring, I decided to to 
you know, take this idea and, and you know, make it more actionable because we had a town hall where the many of our students were had complained about faculty not being um, um, prepared for for the students students that, that we had and um, students you know felt felt insulted by 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 faculty and I think this is something that that we we can start to to address by by talking about you know this how, how we're all learning and we are all um, you know here to learn so um, so that was kind of the the uh, the, the instigating like moment where I was like oh maybe I, as fun as it is you know, teaching undergrad <laughs> intercultural like maybe I can you know I'll also you know bring bring these these topics to to a larger audience and create um, you know a, a ongoing conversation so so that's what essentially I'm hoping to be able to do so during these um, like this as like a mini workshop um, is something that you know we can include in a new faculty orientation, for example. So people who share here may also be able to share there, and we can also in, in include an invitation for our new faculty to join the um, the kind of learning community about inclusive learning as as part of you know to give them give them tools to to be able to adapt to to students here. So. Um, so I'm going to, you know, ask, you know, how after sharing how one of the ways I've adapted, you know, to students, how 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 you have done it, and you know, by you know, being able to collect these and um, and share these, we're we're also increasing the resources that you know the faculty that came have when when we encounter a similar situation, we're able to think about, you know, what what each other yeah, have shared here, um, and so so there's a um, different levels of, of you know, addressing this this solution. I mean, this this issue. But ultimately, you know, we're hoping to to have um, an ongoing process where we're able to to have um, if we if we don't have the budget line, there are these online trainings. You're able to still get the certification for free, and and so that's that still will work um, work you know with. Um, in our in our you know, current economic situation, but ideally, you know, we'll we'll eventually have a budget line for these these kinds of things, and, and we will in, increase the kind of complexity and, and top topic range that we'll be able to explore um, here. So, so um, as as an action plan, in in order for us as faculty to help students becoming engaged global citizens, which comes from the mission, we have to embrace the challenge of you know, becoming and remaining engaged global citizens. And um, so I'm going to be sharing this data, you know, about our students in terms of the um, their racial backgrounds, but um, and we'll be talking about you know, how faculty independently adapted to our students, um, and um, so these discussions and these decisions which are are going to be able to help us um, accomplish the, the initial goals that that I, I shared at the beginning. Um, so ultimately, you know, what we're what we're trying to make happen is, of course, increase the intention retention of students and have these improved connections with faculty. And um, it also gives us some uh, opportunities for engagement, um, and ultimately we, we will be able to create arguments for a, a budget line um, for for this in the future. Um, and of course, we're hoping for this to be relevant to different modal modalities. Of course, there's going to be uh, challenges um, because you know not everybody. Is going to be a part of this, um, but we also want to um, make sure that something like this is is a part of how faculty are, are rewarded um, in terms of professional development um, credit, um, and um, and so so that so that this kind of um, 
can, this will continue that in, in a, there'll be an ex existing incentives. I also want to acknowledge you know, the I guess chilly environment from, from the Texas uh, capital that that is exists you know, around um, addressing DEI explicitly um, and and so um, we want to also make sure that that you know I, I as a, as a communication scholar embracing intercultural because this is that's just how, how we approach just, uh, diversity. Um, but we we do have an aspect of intercultural communication that is that does is, is some more similar to, to the DEI and that's something I'll, I'll go into in a little bit but but it's it's important to just um, acknowledge and, and recognize the, the environment you know that that we exist within and um, and also I also acknowledge that that you know th there is op opportunities for people to be resistant to some of this um, and and that's that's fine as I had mentioned there um, intercultural communication is about encountering difference and this is often ha has a, a level of, of you know, feeling feeling uncomfortable and and so that that is is part of the course on, on, on a certain level um, but but um, so let's go ahead and and dive into what is intercultural communication and pedagogy, and then I'll provide an example from you know my experiences of teaching at UHV and how I've taken culture into consideration with adopting um, a, cl a class policy, and I'll um, I'll offer you know you to share examples. All right, so. So intercultural communication can happen on um, in, in a lot of different ways. You can, of course, be somebody that visits a um, another country on a cruise and you know engages with the locals in a way that's your that's um, ethnocentric. You know, that's not really interested in exploring the culture because you're on vacation or you're just not <laughs> there. For the culture, but um, but I, so the ideal way of, of exploring in, intercultural communication in this context is about about being flexible um, in in how you approach it because um, it is about being able to manage the cultural differences creatively and adaptively across a wide range of, of situations. So um, and this is different from critical intercultural communication, which is um, a, it has more of a focus and an interest on on power and positionality um, and how how the people who are from different um, backgrounds are are impacted by by positionality and power. So this is the part of intercultural communication that is more kind of interested in and, and similar to DEI. Um, and and so I just want to put that out there, just to to so that there's not a kind of confusion about about the two. Like they they both they both ex exist, but but I think as an institution, it's really important to to um, as as a goal, you know, have have this um, understanding of of our our interests in in managing cultural difference creatively and adaptively. And um, individuals, you know, if you want to um, to um, take it further and and you know, be critical and um, address issues of positionality and power, you, you're also welcome to individually. But because of the Texas environment, right, our institution might not be able to support that goal as much as the overall you know, intercultural and pedagogy goal. So. Um, also, it's important to go ahead and, and talk about what culture is. Um, so one uh, definition we have here is culture is a set of human-made objective and subjective elements. And I mean, that in the past have in increased the probability of survival and resulted in satisfaction for participants in an ecological niche, and thus be became shared among those who could communicate with each other because they had a common language and they lived in the same time and place. And so, and so culture is essentially you know, something that, that lives inside individuals. It has 
you know, objective elements, um, like traditions and, and rituals, but there's the um, subjective things of, in terms of the personal meaning you, you give to Christmas or another holiday or, or, or different symbols. Um, and, and so culture is, um, the other examples like that we go over in our class, um, it entails the different kind of values that the people will have our understanding of our identity and our ability to understand and recognize other people's identities and the um, um, transition in terms of migration and culture shock and it's also about the language that we use uh, to verbally and um, communicate whether it's written or orally and of course there's also nonverbal communication um, and there, those are all different aspects of culture um, that you can um, use to help you think about what um, examples you might have. So, and, and pedagogy is, of course, the study of methods and activities of, of teaching. And so, this will um, include, you know, your your preparation and the um, the things that you do at the end of class um, in order to prepare for the, you know, the next time you teach this class in addition to all the decisions that unfold you know, during during the teaching process. So, um, so yeah, so now I'm going to oops, okay, provide an example you know, of, of how I have um, adopted a classroom policy in light of, of what I understand about intercultural communication. Um, so I knew that at the in, when I initially came to UHV, I um, taught a lot of of face to face classes, and and one of the things that you know is a part of the policies um, when you do face to face classes a tardy policy, and and it was also something that I was pretty good at uh, making note of in terms of in this in the syllabus some people are um, not there I mean, when class starts and they come in a little late right but um and, and it is often a policy that you know if people collect a certain amount of tardies there might be some kind of infraction um but I also am somebody who I attended Spelman College a historically black college where um we we all had this kind of shared agreement of where class may start at nine, but there's still people coming in, so class doesn't really start at nine, and and you're not you're not penalized by being one of those people who are still coming in, um, and and so there's this like CP time understanding of culture, a time um, there that we kind of all all have, but at the same time I also took classes at Morehouse. And that Morehouse is across the street, the all male school. Their flagship um, program is business, and so they try to instill in all of their students that if you're not, if you're not there five minutes early or late, um, and and so you know going to a class there, you do have to internalize that. And this is an example of how institutions are teaching about culture and helping their students understand this cultural dynamic and and to be able to adapt you know to, to different culture um, in terms of in terms of how how time is, is treated and so um, you know as an instructor as a, I was able to recognize that you know for some students their habit of of being late or not being there on time that it, that is it, it could be more of a cultural thing and not a um, a, a matter of just not really caring and then not not um you know getting their stuff to, together um and um and so in tracking you know the issues of, of tardiness there's there wasn't kind of an automatic way of treating this this topic i i decided to connect it more to their, their performance and their grades than, than rather ju than just like the numerical issue alone um because because of the, there is a, a cultural dynamic at, in, at play in how people regard uh, time and, and adapt to 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 these, to these different cultures, and so some some of our students may not 
be you know aware of these different time cultures and um, and how how different people can can regard time. So um, so that's so that's one example of of adapting like a pedagogy to to acknowledge cultural differences. I wanted to open up the floor to see if anybody else has any uh, story or an example. I can share one. Yeah. Uh, not necessarily in the classroom setting, but I had the opportunity to work in the U.S. Virgin Islands and being able to adapt to a culture that really wasn't familiar to me. And time, I realized no one really wore watches. <laughs> and uh, so I had to learn how to adapt and adjust to the cultural setting uh, because I was in perioperative services, DOR, surgeries, and time is money in my mind. Uh, but they, they took a different approach. And so I was there for six years. And uh, it took a while for them to adapt to my philosophy and me to adapt to theirs. But uh, through it all, we, we found common ground in understanding what we were trying to achieve. Uh, and so I was able to work out some logistics on you know, when that nurse got in the room and what that physician was expecting uh, and understanding how that their culture of time played a huge part in why we weren't getting in the room on time with the patient. Um, because the philosophy was, we're going to do it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, and so I can totally relate to not just taking something black and white face value. You have to really dig a little bit deeper into understanding uh, why someone is, is acting the way they're acting. Uh, and understanding their culture and what could be compiling the situation. Because in my mind, it was black and white. <laughs> so I learned from that. I, I love the phrase that you use, finding common ground, right? And finding common ground requires patience. It requires adaptability, flexibility. It requires listening. And all of those things are hard to do, right? When it's much easier just to be a dictator and say, no, it's this way, right? So that, I think, is the challenge for me as a teacher. As I get older and older and older and further removed from the ages of my students, as we all are, right, <laughs> is trying to find common ground. Now, when I was a 25-year-old teacher, I knew all the latest fads and trends and TV shows <laughs> and songs. But now, as a you know, older <laughs> teacher, I am a little out of touch. And so it's taking more patience more listening on my part to find that common ground, especially with our first gen students. I, I'm wondering the rest of us, like whether you're faculty or staff, we're all dealing with the same students, right? It's not like staff are seeing something different when they come to your offices. These are the same human beings and our first gen students, our underserved student populations. What kind of observations do you all have about this dynamic of intercultural communication. I'm curious to hear from that point of view too. Staff folks. <laughs> Julie. <laughs> well, what, one of the realizations I've had is that students much better prefer uh, communicating like more like an instant communication instead of emails and so forth. And sometimes the message can get derailed uh, through email and they don't check their emails, and so I use a lot of Microsoft Teams chat mm -hmm. options for my students, and I, I that way I can kind of separate a little bit more on the communication, the formality of the emails and so forth versus the instant messages that they do check because they're always on their phones. So for me, it has helped them at least communicating outside of the classroom with the students to use that option a little bit better. Uh, I do find it a lot more useful and sometimes I just have to call them because the message is not, they're trying to get something across and they're not very good at it yet. Uh, they're working on their communication skills <laughs> and so sometimes it's just picking up the phone. They're more used to that and communicating with chat options. Hmm. So, so they still talk on the phone. Oh, I didn't. Yeah. And some of them, you kind of have to force them because, then, you know, you're trying to figure out what's going on hmm. in their situation, why they're not coming to class. Um, and then our, our students have a lot going on outside of the classroom. And so yeah. we have to be cognizant yeah. that 
maybe it's not their priority. Maybe they have a family that they're feeding or taking care of parents. and They have a variety of different uh, situations in their lives. Well said. Anybody else? I have, I have something. I feel like while these students know a lot about how to, how to communicate, like how to do TikTok and Snapchat and all these things, I'm finding that when it comes to like Canvas and uploading assignments, that I don't know how much computer literacy that they've had before coming here. Because I have students who, who I had one actually this morning who, you know, he was concerned he can't do his assignment. He can't submit it. Well, when I went and looked, it's already uploaded. He went all the way to uploading it. He just didn't click the submit button. You know, so sometimes I think it's just like they, you know, maybe they didn't have computers in high school and didn't have the ability to have the computer literacy. And now all of a sudden, boom, we use Canvas for everything or Teams for everything. And I think some of them are kind of feel left behind. So we're having to kind of pick them up and, you know, help them out in that situation. That, that's so interesting, Christy, because on the one hand, they have no trouble uploading a TikTok video or posting it or editing it, which to me is much harder than doing anything on Canvas. But then Correct. the thing of submit your assignment blo blows their mind. That's such a great observation. Hmm. Faculty don't push the submit button. Right. Yeah. We see that in the progress report. Yes. Other thoughts, observations. Anybody else? Well, this is this is just to put that to put that in perspective, Christy. That's not just students. That's me too. I mean, it's not entirely obvious. So sometimes I think it's done in Canvas, and you know, there's a save button hidden down below that I didn't see. So um, I just thought I'd say that for to be funny. But in well, no, response, I, yeah, go ahead. In response to Umberto's or to piggyback on Umberto's, one of the um, meeting students where there are um, my students, the biggest thing that I see is anxiety, fear, uncertainty, doubt. And so I have over the last couple of years adopted language of assumed success, where I tell people every single time I'm like, I know you can do this. Um, I believe in you, and it's just a matter of whether this is the right time given everything else in your life right now, right? And so as soon as I think students feel like we're on their side and we believe in them, then that might help shift and support their mindset. I'm like, oh, okay, so I am a college person, right? Some of our students, like, you know, my, I get a lot of non-traditional students coming back and they teach biology, so it's a scary subject, so... That's my main thing is 100% um, positivity and support. That's excellent. Well said. Other things? I have a, um, a couple of points. So yeah. to Nicole's um, point about flexible communication, I think that's really important. I come from a very conservative, very formal background. So I'm originally from Nigeria. And so we're very formal in our communication. <laughs> And I had to learn with our students, I think that intimidates them. So even in my written communication to my students, I used to always start off with a greeting like, good morning, Mr. Johnson, how are you? And da, 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 da. And sometimes they responded, sometimes they didn't. And I learned that that intimidated them. So I had to change the type of written communication that I had with my students to be a little bit less formal or more informal. And they seemed to respond to that a little bit better. And one thing that I noticed as someone who came to this country, um, and English was my second language, jargon is not necessarily helpful all the time in our classes. And so I remember when I was in the third grade, my teacher told me to park it. And I had no idea what she meant by that. So I was just staring at her and she said, <laughs> and so that meant sit down, but I didn't know that. And so she thought I was being disobedient. So she sent me to the principal's office. And so I had many of those types of instances throughout um, my, my early education. Another time I had on sandals and I guess the click, clack, click, clack was annoying my teacher. So she told me to, to pick up my feet. So I started to march because I was really trying to like pick my feet up. And she thought I was trying to be like funny and disrespectful. So she sent me to the corner. So 
I try not to use jargon in our classes because especially for our international students or first gen students or students where English is not their first language, it doesn't register and it doesn't make sense to them. So I try to make sure when I speak to them that I don't use jargon or slang that they may not necessarily understand because it can create more confusion. That, that's awesome. And, and we often talk about the empathy deficit, right? Whether we're staff or faculty, understanding our students and where they're coming from. I'm wondering, Dr. Elo, because of those personal experiences you had, does that increase your capacity to be empathetic with your students and understand what they're going through, especially some of our students who might not speak English as a first language or not be? Absolutely. Not and, and I tell them that like the first um, couple of days and weeks of class and I and I let them know that English is my second language so they can understand that I didn't come here learning and knowing this language. And so if there's a language barrier or if there are things that they don't understand, please come to me because I'll understand what they've been through or what they're going through because English is a very tricky language for those of you who are native speakers. Um, and so again, like little jargons and little sayings that, that I now know um, doesn't necessarily land with some of our students. And I would never use that jargon in class. I wouldn't say it doesn't land because they may not understand that. But yes, it does make me a little bit more empathetic to answer your question, Woodrow, to our students because I can understand where they're coming from. So that was actually really great. It reminded me of so many things because yeah, when I when it came to dress, I definitely was like uh, Dr. Elo, in which I liked dressing more formally. And then I had a student in my own personal class, like she just like, told me how she felt about it <laughs> and how it kind of intimidates her. And I was like, oh. Well, how okay. did she feel about it? Yeah, no, she was saying she's like, when people dress more casually, that she feel more comfortable. And like, when people are dressing like, you know, more like formally, she might be more intimidated or not. Mm -hmm. That helped me uh, embrace like casualness more, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, but in, in what she called jargon is part of this other um, umbrella of culturally like rel attached uh, like phrases like um, that can also be called idioms or euphemisms. They're all really culturally contingent. And yes, I did have an experience where I, I used idiom um, to communicate with a group of students who are like mostly non-native um, like students. And after when they didn't like reply or do anything, I was like, oh, that's why, that's what happened. I, I like, use an idiom to tell them to do this again instead of saying do this again and um so i couldn't fault them completely <laughs> not understanding what i wrote but um so it is it is important to keep you know that 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 in mind yeah i have something mm -hmm. so I, one of the things that i'm thinking about in all of this conversation is just how you know they're is no sort of uh, copy and paste absolute principle to follow here because on the one hand, sometimes discomfort is important, an important part of everybody's growth process. And so if the student says, I feel uncomfortable, it doesn't mean you have to change what you're doing. Maybe it depends on what we're talking about, but um, the thing that feels really universal and important to what you're saying is the this lens of understanding student behaviors through cultural norms relaxes and sometimes in the teacher the the anger impulse that we have where like oh they are choosing not to comply with this these academic norms that they're not actually or my norms or whatever and to to understand that it it's not necessarily you don't have to see it through that lens it's really helpful um but anyway the one of the things for me that i definitely felt was a cultural thing when i came to south texas is i have 
a ridiculously casual affect, maybe too casual, you know, and I tell the students to call me by my first name, and I try and tell them, do not everybody is that way, but I sometimes use curse words, you know, and um, there are students who they don't they forget about the curse words, like that's just, of course there's students who don't feel comfortable with that. But, and, and they prob probably not in a productive way, you know, like I, and I've got, I did get into trouble with that a year ago. But um, just, I think the, the sort of, um, you know, hippie style or whatever is not gonna, I think there are a lot of students in, in South Texas who they want to respect their professor and they want to call them professor or Mrs. Pittendrick and you know I think um, I've adapted a little bit. It's, a, it's hard to control but I think you know you just have to find whatever tone or approach is going to be the most effective with your audience which is where you, what you're coming where you're coming from Nicole. Yeah exactly um, and that's also was one of the differences that I saw when I came here in terms of like there's the respect culture respectfulness that you get from all our students whereas the Midwest yeah, <laughs> uh, it's a little different but <laughs> but yeah so I did want to go ahead and and transition to I share some of this demographic info that that I um, that I collected so so this year um, this is from 2023, all of the university. So we see we have 14% African American, 7%, almost 8% Asian American, 40% Hispanic, 3% international, about 28% white, 5% other. Um, and so I'll go through this like, fairly quickly and you'll, you'll see like a little up. Uh, minor variations but in some areas you'll see you'll see larger variations and so you want to keep in mind your university and what level you you teach at um, and, and of course this is all information that you can take into um, applying uh, inclusive pedagogy um, and, and continuing to, to learn about about this so this is the undergrad um, so we see um, it's changed a little bit in terms of uh, African American, it's 12, um, not seven. Um, Hispanic is 44, not uh, 40. And um, international went down just a little bit. But, um, and so when we break undergrad down from by college, we'll see how, how, how this we spread out through the different the different colleges that we have. So we have CNAS with 14% uh, African American and 12 um, Asian American, um, as a little bit less Hispanic, um, and 6% international. And we have other 6% and white at 24. Um, education and health. Um, we see the the ones at the top, African and Asian, a little smaller, Hispanic is much bigger. Um, and business, it's kind of close to the initial one with African American 11, Hispanic is at 45, um, Asian American is larger here too. Um, and in the liberal arts, College, we have more international, less Asian American, um, and now let's take a look at the grad demographics. See, this um, is this um, is the the main differences that I see is of course the Hispanic um, block is, is much smaller, and that's something that as an institute, Hispanics are an institution here, we can. Think about and um, try to learn more about about what happens there. Um, African American is at almost twenty percent, um, and Asian American at um, almost 
ten percent, um, but um, Hispanic has gone down to less less than thirty percent um, here, and um, so we'll see some differences between the colleges. This is a business, um, and it's it's interesting to see how they kind of are spread out here, um, and. Dr. Kwanzaa had a question real quick. Uh -huh. Dr. Kwanzaa? Yes, okay. And so I have a uh, quick question about the race. You know, having different race in your uh, class is very interesting, but how do you communicate with different race without coming across as being racist or, or coming across as if, uh, you are treating uh, your class, you know, the student differently. Um, because uh, sometimes we want to really try to adapt to everybody and and by so doing, uh, I, I don't know, but if you have any experience or any idea on suggestion on that, on how to really communicate with all these different or you just have to be straight talk to everybody the same because they are in the same class you are teaching them the same subject how do you not come across as if you are treating each one differently so yeah a great question because essentially our, our our students do want to be treated as as individuals and i think you're also balancing that with um, yes, of having a policy that applies to, to everybody, but essentially this is this is just a primer for for being able to explore that question um, more in depth based on you know what your your subject matter is and what what kind of people you interact with. So so the um, there is the, um, the Columbia no, it's Cornell course. That that is exploring you know this topic a little more. That you're welcome to to join us in um, in in that that conversation. Um, so so that's that's what I'll go ahead and you know, jump to now. Okay. Also, this is the CNAS CNAS in international grad program. Is at it's forty percent. I just thought that was interesting in terms of the different differences that we that we have. Um, but but again, so. Please reach out to me. There's um if you would like to join this um <coughs> it's, a, it's an online you know learning program that you know you can use at your own pace. But I'd like to be able to to talk with other people about about this this process and we we meet just a few times during a semester to, to, to go over this. Um and so it's um they do have a waiver that is are really easy to apply for and to basically you know allow you to take it take it for free and there's um there's a bunch of other resources that i found that that offer you know similar classes and they also have stem specific um courses like this that i'm hoping not um you know people will be able to to, to take and, and and do as well so um so that is is all that i have for today um, do, do we have a little bit of time for questions or? Yeah, Dr. Nicole Eugene, thank you, first of all, so much. Let's all give her a big round of applause. Like she said, there are some areas you can follow up. And Dr. Eugene, if you want to go to that previous slide again, there's this great opportunity to expand this conversation. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing stopping us from having more of these sessions where we can get more in depth with this topic, because obviously we could talk about this a lot more. So any final questions or comments before we end? Um, I want to put in the chat, you know, we're trying to do something every single week here at the Center for Teaching and Learning Excellence, whether it's lunch and learn, whether it's co-curricular activities, and next week is going to be a big, big activity. We have this group called the Slants that are coming. And if you don't know about the Slants, here's a little promo I put in the chat. But needless to say, this is a punk rock group who had an incredible journey of civic learning and democratic engagement that I think has lessons for all of us instructors and staff 
who care about making better citizens out of our students. And it is an incredible journey of rock and roll all the way from California to the Supreme Court of the United States. And I'm, ha I'm, I'm happy to tell you, they won their case, right, in the Supreme Court. And it's just this amazing journey they went through. So they're going to be performing live here at UHV next Thursday night. And you'll see more promos and more emails from me about it. But I would highly encourage you to invite your students to be part of this. If you're a staff member, to invite your colleagues to be part of this. It's going to be, I think, a fascinating day and a fascinating evening. So I've got a promo there in the, in the chat, but more information to come. Thank you so much for taking this time. I know a lot of us have got one o'clock meetings and we got to get on to the next thing. But thank you for spending this time with us. Look out for more of these opportunities in the future and tell your friends that we're doing this as well. Everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Take care. Dr. Eugene, thank you so much. So fantastic. And all those who are joining us for the first time, please come back. Bring a friend. And there's snacks. You can take snacks to go.